Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out and listening to these lectures under these very difficult circumstances. Obviously, this is not the most propitious time to be doing these things because I'm in quarantine, as you all know. I just got back from Colombia, uh, and you know, I was in the airport. I looked some uh, doorknobs. No, just kidding. I did not do that. Uh, but. I hope everyone is doing well. I think I'm dying over here, uh, but that's perfectly fine because, you know, I'm in a very good age group in uh, between 20 and 30. So anyways, what we're going to do here today is first chapter seven of the book. Now, remember, this is intelligence. Very exciting uh, area. Uh, as people know, when I came back from Nicaragua, I lived in Latin America eight years of my life. I was solicited by the CIA. I don't agree with everything the CIA does in other uh, intelligence agencies. In fact, I think, uh, well, we're going to get into that right now. But remember, intelligence is a subset of information tailored specifically to help the state. Now, as this book and other things talk about, you know, there's this intelligence cycle right down there, as you can see it, plain as day. Now, that's how the world is supposed to be, this five-part cycle where you have the collection, the analysis, you know, then obviously we dis disseminate the information, etc. But there is a big thing we are missing, and that is what we call the politicization of this uh, data. So the politicization is very important. And I like how the book differentiates between downward and upward politicization. Downward is essentially the policymaker is the main agent. Uh, the policymaker creates these incentives for certain information and basically doesn't tolerate information that goes against his or her you know, view of the world or what they want to believe. William Casey is one of the best examples during the Reagan administration. He basically said, you know, I want to find information of Soviet infiltration in Central America, where I lived quite a long time. You know, that during the uh, 1980s, the Sandinistas that overthrew Somoza in 1979 were agents of the Soviet Union. And if you don't find that information, well, essentially, I don't want to hear anything about it. This becomes very uh, difficult. The same thing goes with weapons of mass destruction. Uh, a lot of people uh, believe that the intelligence, especially if in my U.S. foreign policy class, this is national security, but in my U.S. foreign policy class, we use the pillar book. And he essentially talks a lot about how, you know, they just kind of cherry pick the sent uh, sentence that is the Bush administration on the fact that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction, but they said that they were far away from it. And most of the intelligence actually wasn't that bad. It was simply politicized. This is very important. And remember, there's a wide range of areas of intelligence. You have like down here, open source, human signals, imagery, measurement. We're going to get into a lot of these uh, different areas. And they're basically often, like I said, politicized. Uh, the second type of politicization, as you can see, is, is what we call upward politicization. That is when the analyst aims to please uh, the consumer of intelligence. This is very important because why would she or he do this? Well, you know, for career uh, opportunities. One of the books I use in my U.S. foreign policy class, which is very interesting, uh, they talk about they have this little section on the Vietnam War where people who didn't agree with the Vietnam War in the State Department essentially were fired. Uh, a lot of foreign service officers and others, their goal is to basically uh, pull the line of the government. You know, uh, here at ASU, we have ambassadors come around and a lot, you know, say, oh, you know, we support Trump, we support Bush, we support all these people, you know, instead of being critical of a lot of these policies. And this becomes a big issue. You know, even if you took the Obama administration, I mean, his support of overthrowing Gaddafi, although I'm not a big fan of Gaddafi, he was very popular when he overthrew the government in basically a, a non-civil war. But, uh, you know, years later, Gaddafi petered out. That is the, the ex, the former leader of Libya. But, you know, Obama's incursions in Libya and getting rid of Gaddafi ended up being a disaster. And, you know, it's a failed state to this day. We don't have 
have an embassy. And we have to be more critical of these policies. Clinton bombing the Sudan, you know, Reagan's, you know, illegal foreign policy in Central America. Uh, we have to be critical of all people, all, all parties, etc. cetera. Uh, and the same thing goes because this is national security, not U.S. foreign policy. We have to start talking about, you know, national security like we have been from different perspectives. What is the national security, for example, in Bangladesh, you know, against what's going on in Myanmar, which is really uh, uh, disastrous for Bangladesh, already one of the most populous countries in the world, and now it's getting a flood of refugees from Myanmar. You know, what is intelligence telling them? Uh, and to what degree do states have higher uh, 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 technological intelligence? A lot of people think, and I would be one to agree, I've had a lot of soldiers and other people from the government in my classes, that, you know, we're not relying enough on human intelligence, that is human intelligence, uh, which is, is, is much more important in a lot of ways uh, than the other. But we have imagery that's going to be important, particularly in the Cuban Missile Crisis, which we're going to go over, etc. But for now, remember, there's a lot of ways to collect intelligence as the book goes over. Uh, and also, um, there's also a lot of ways to politicize the data. You know, even are we getting the data we want? You know, consumers, that is the people reading the data, might cherry pick small information uh, or they might ignore information, cognitive dissonance that doesn't fit his or her view of the world or what they want to know. And this also is we're going to get into bureaucratic battles. Uh, that's a big thing. People are less inclined or bureaucracies to share information. So this is something we have to start talking about is like the politicization first downward. That's where the policymaker creates incentives for certain information. Uh, and then we have essentially uh, upward politicization where uh, maybe someone is trying to um, please the consumer of intelligence. And either way, we can get really bad strategic policy out of this, uh, because we want to say, you know, we want our views of the world to be true. Iraq does have WMDs. You know, uh, if we get rid of Gaddafi, the Libyan people are going to take to the streets and create democracy. Apparently, that is not true. After they uh, overthrew Gaddafi, they quite predictably started fighting among themselves, which happens after many revolutions. From the Soviet Union, well, that is when the Tsar was overthrown. I mean, there was basically a civil war. You know, the white Russians, the Reds, uh, the Bolsheviks, that is the militia vics, all these people. Uh, same thing after uh, the Shah of Iran was overthrown in 1979. You know, it wasn't just the uh, 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 Islamic movement that was fighting. There were a lot of movements in there, communists, you know, uh, state capitalists, uh, libertarian, you know, kind of like liberal capitalists, uh, co you know, socialists during that time. A, a wide range of groups, students, some just didn't like the Shah. And then they thought after, you know, after after uh, Khomeini took power, it basically went in the wrong direction. So the question is, you know, what uh, happens with this kind of intelligence and how do we politicize it? So without further ado, you know, I'm going to talk about a wide range of different policies. And remember, this cannot just be simply uh, the United States. Uh, view of the world. This has to be a wide range of views of the world so that we can basically, basically uh, understand the world. And now, I have to pause sometime during this. Um, so if, you know, this is our first time using Zoom, becoming very good with Zoom. So if, you know, if there's any problem, uh, please don't, uh, you know, please understand. But regardless, you know, we're going to go over different types of intelligence. Remember, oh, and this is the attack, which I actually like. You know, at first you see uh, what we call a strategic surprise. This can endanger the nation's existence. Uh, you know, Pearl Harbor, the Cuban Missile Crisis. What does that mean? I mean, this is a surprise that intelligence should basically try to figure out whether it's through human, whether it's through imagery uh, and other means. Basically, the idea is that a, a strategic surprise can basically change a nation's whole entire existence. It's a challenge to it. The Cuban Missile Crisis, as we all know, uh, basically was, you know, I mean, we could have been, uh, 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 it could have been such a disastrous, such a disastrous um, 
event. But as you saw in the video, you will see, you know, did Kennedy, by giving Khrushchev a way out and the intelligence used during the Cuban Missile Crisis, did that save the planet? And that's something for you to, to uh, uh, basically debate. Also, Lowenthal talks about Pearl Harbor as well in the other book. This is very, very important. And remember, Lowenthal's book, the one you're reading, is actually a classic for people who want to work in the CIA or other intelligence organizations. But remember, from my point of view, you do not have to ever agree with me. I think he gets a few things wrong on this, particularly, you know, uh, overthrowing Mossadegh, the democratically elected uh, prime minister of Iran, which he considers a success, which we're going to talk about, and also overthrowing the Arbenz government in Guatemala, uh, you know, 54, I think it's 53 uh, Mossadegh, 54 Arbenz. These might have been seen as successes, but they were clearly intelligence failures, as we're going to talk about. But remember, the other type of surprise is a tactical surprise. What this basically does is it doesn't endanger the existence of a particular state or non-state actor, but it does produce a psychological effect. And I think that was what 9-11 was about. 9-11 uh, was a very big psychological effect on the United States, very emotional. Now we have students who aren't alive at the time. I actually was, although I'm very young. I was still alive at the time. And the psychological effect that it, it took a toll on the United States. The same thing with things like Al-Shabaab. A lot of people say, what's, what's the reason that Al-Shabaab, for example, attacks the Kenyan mall? They wanted Kenya to pull out of the African Union. So, you know, some of these, uh, uh, sup these attacks that intelligence is supposed to know earlier on, and we're going to talk about why they sometimes fail, is, is uh, you know, they're not just a strategic surprise like the Cuban Missile Crisis that could have ended the planet as we know it, but, you know, these are very tactical surprises. You know, the Tet Offensive, a lot of people think was a tactical surprise. They knew they weren't going to win, but the fact that they, they fought us in our own embassy in Vietnam uh, was basically a, a tactical surprise to show that we weren't winning the war, that is from my, you know, the United States points of view, and that that would even galvanize and, and facilitate more protests, more movements to get out of the war. So the question is, is, you know, what intelligence is supposed to know or, 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 or be able to even predict, you know, you might get information about an attack or can you predict the tax, which both the Lowenthal book and the Pillar book, the Pillar book again from a U.S. foreign policy, uh, basically says that this is very dangerous because then it expects too much from intelligence. And what I also like are the two schools here, the proximate school, uh, because I was writing before, I guess it stays with it, uh, and the distant school. The proximate school is very, very interesting, and it's a theory about intelligence that intelligence people who are basically analysts should be very close to the consumer of intelligence, the policy makers of intelligence. But the argument is, is that if you're not, if you're too close, then as the distance school uh, emphasizes, you become politicized, right? You know, you begin to feel comfortable. You start telling people what they want to hear, you know, which might not be the best system. So uh, the proximate school says if you're too far away from the policymakers, the analysts become more and more irrelevant, irrelevant, and then they get heard less. It's kind of like uh, Graham Allison's bureaucratic politics model in which these people were saying, oh yeah, you know, uh, 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 the closer you are to the president, you know, the better chance you get listening to him. Like, you know, during the Iraq war, George Bush, you know, he had Dick Cheney, uh, Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz, whereas Condoleezza Rice, Colm Powell, who are less, less uh, 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 listened to by the president. Uh, he did not heed their calls. They got, and obviously General Shinseki as well, who was, from my understanding, fired from Rumsfeld. Uh, so you basically have all this uh, kind of information. So you, is the proximate school better or the distant school? That's going to depend on, on you. And don't forget, one of the interesting things is the bureaucracy all of these rivalries uh, that exist. Uh, and remember, just the, the most salient one, the CIA versus 
the FBI. Uh, as you are going to watch in the video of, of the Weather Underground, is it called the, uh, uh, what is it, the uh, uh, Weather Underground, if you say, <laughs> what, what, you know, the weather's going underground, don't tell anyone it's going to be sunny. That quote unquote terrorist group basically was, you know, uh, uh, they were brought to court. But it was found that they, their constitutional rights were stepped on, which you're going to see. So why were they let out, even though they blew things up, is basically because the FBI is a creature of the State Department, and the FBI has to follow certain laws. The CIA, no. The CIA is more of a rogue organization, uh, you know, throughout history, as, as we're going to read in, in the books. You know, you have the church committee, you have the family jewels, you have all these controversies with the CIA, not that there's none with the FBI, but they're more of a rogue organization. You know, they can torture people, right? But the FBI can't torture people. <laughs> then they have to bring them in in front of a grand jury. And then the, then the, their lawyers say, hey, they were tortured and under duress when they gave this information. And then it's like, oh, okay, you know, <laughs> obviously we're not going to accept this information because they were tortured. So, you know, the FBI is kind of this baby or this creature of the Justice Department where the CIA is not. So uh, a lot of people think that the CIA and other organizations can do things that might not be on the up and up, uh, and that there's a strong rivalry between these two groups uh, that we can talk about. Um, now, there's a few things in, 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 in the book I want to talk about, and this becomes kind of a weakness with intelligence, but I like when Molenthal talks about this kind of pol this collection swarm. Uh, if you can see it here, uh, you basically have the producers and analysts focus on some high-end issue, uh, but leaving little emphasis on other issues that might be just as important, but not as a salient, newsworthy, etc. So after 9-11, obviously everything went into, um, you know, quote unquote, terrorist attacks, particularly, you know, Islamic fundamentalism, etc. When a lot of people think they dropped the ball and was basically, you know, missed out, you know, the rise of China and these other state actors. And this is exactly what Trump, one of our debates, the Trump administration at this time is basically changing uh, our national security approach from non-state actors to focusing more on state actors. And that's very important because, you know, a lot of where does the investment go? With, what do we do with, say, our, our finite resources? There's opportunity cost to use the words of an economist. So do we um, invest in say language skills, certain language skills, do we buy certain equipment? Because it's significantly different to try to take on non-state actors, guerrilla groups as we saw, which are very difficult to root out by the way, uh, and or uh, state actors like Iran, China, et cetera. So collection swarm, what I like about that, uh, I wouldn't call it a theory, but an idea of intelligence and how we collect, it's basically, you know, saying that a lot of analysts begin to focus on very salient and very prominent themes, issues, social economic phenomena, while they basically leave little space, which is very important for other issues that just might be just as important. And, you know, maybe we weren't before 9-11 thinking about terrorism when we should have, uh, when you had attacks in Argentina, when you had uh, two embassies attacked in Africa, but yet the collection swarm wasn't focusing on that kind of terrorism. And did we kind of drop the ball uh, uh, to a certain degree? And then priority creep is very uh, similar, whereas bureaucrats want to privatize one issue over another. And what I like about priority creep, which kind of strikes me as interesting is, you know, there's a lot of political pressure. Uh, Walt has a, a a theory balance of threat and the idea isn't just that we balance other states that is states against other states but there's a lot of uh, uh, a psychological and perception added to that and exiles sometimes put pressure 
on U.S. policymakers. So one of the best is Florida. You know, in an election year, it's very exciting. Why is Trump so obsessed with Venezuela? Why did he roll back Obama's uh, detente opening with Cuba? You know, why does Trump want Juan Guaido, this leader, uh, which is kind of strange. It's just like, hey, you know, here's this guy. I'm all of a sudden president of Venezuela. Well, okay. Uh, so then he becomes president of Venezuela, Juan Guaido. Why is he so obsessed with this guy? And one of the reasons is, is basically uh, this priority creep, uh, which I think the reason why we're so obsessed with Venezuela is because Trump very astutely wants the Florida vote, and he's pandering to a lot of the quote unquote exiles against it. Now, I'm no fan of Maduro, that's the current president of, of, of Venezuela, uh, but you know, supporting Juan Guaido, he's not from the most popular party. I don't think he has a lot, as much support as we like to think. He has a lot in Florida, but much less in, in the country. And this is what happens a lot uh, with this idea. So, priority creep, it might be pressed by people who don't like a particular government in their country. And Florida is very interesting because Florida has is a swing state and there's a lot of exiles there. So for example, one of the interesting things when Somoza, that's the uh, former dictator of Nicaragua, was killed in Paraguay. He, he, was the, he was the leader of Nicaragua, but he was killed in Paraguay. They took his body and had a huge funeral for him in Miami because a lot of Nicaraguans in Florida love Somoza. They were old Somocistas, but he was a brutal dictator and not popular in his own country. I, in fact, I remember living in Nicaragua and they tried to come back after the Sandinistas were kicked out in 1990. We supported an illegal war against Nicaragua. Uh, I was there much later, like in 1997, 2000, etc. And they tried to create a Somocista party and it didn't go anywhere, but they were still popular with the Miami exiles. So this might have to do with priority creep, where basically there's a lot of prioritization of a particular policy, but it might not be the most important policy, right? I mean, Venezuela is important, but how, how important is it to get rid of Maduro? And it's really not Maduro in power. What Maduro has done in Venezuela is given the, the uh, military more power than it's ever seen in its history. Um, uh, Carlos Andres Perez, uh, who was popular in his first, not popular in his second, actually had a military man head of the oil industry. Uh, but now Vladimir Padrino, uh, under Maduro, is probably, I would consider, the leader of um, of Venezuela. So when we talk about Maduro, even Juan Guaido, et cetera, we have to deal with the military, because to me, it's like more of a military dictatorship. Uh, but that's something a little different, but this is very important for priority creep. Why do we care so much about Cuba? Do we really care that much about Cuba? No, I mean, but it's pandered to the people in Florida, so then they can, you know, get their priority. And they have the right, I mean, this is America, you have the right to, to, to uh, organize, to protest, to create lobbying groups. But is, should this be Cuba a titanic you know, issue. I, I personally don't think so. I don't see a problem with making relations with Cuba. We have relations with Vietnam, China, a wide range of countries. And we have, as, as you know, you've taken my classes and stuff, uh, a wide range of dictatorships, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Equatorial Guinea, I mean, Equatorial Guinea, Teodoro Obeyang is crazy. The only Spanish African country in, in, in Africa. And that guy, because he has an archipelago state and has a lot of oil, we run with these oil companies. Uh, a lot of our friends in the former Soviet uh, blocs, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, you know, Islam Karimov of Uzbekistan, who I believe died. I'm not a, <laughs> a, a central uh, Asian expert, but, you know, I mean, this guy was a brutal dictator, put his own daughter in his in prison so you know we have a lot of dictators etc the question is with priority creep we become focused on uh, a select few and we want to we want the information right so we want to believe in the venezuelan case juan guaido is popular you know he is going to take over venezuela and he's going to you know ride in on a horse and and do something and, and, and he failed just like enrique caprile is someone formed before him and we don't understand that maybe these people aren't as popular like ahmad chalabi ahmad chalabi was not popular in iraq he was wanted for bank fraud he lived in jordan but he really had the president Bush's ear and we really listened to him oh we're gonna go you're gonna go in there and you're gonna be heroes and all this stuff and it was a complete failure and Ahmad Chalabi you know tried to run an election he only got like 
2%. So the question becomes, you know, what kind of intelligence do we want? You know, I think the best kind of intelligence, one, I'll go over it later, but coding, uh, uh, objective coding, like the article you read on Venezuela, where it really talks about how the protesters actually committed more violence than the government. Not that I take sides, but that's just how the coding went. And uh, uh, second, you know, you have to accept information that doesn't fit your view of the world. And it's very, you have to be a mature person and we all don't like that sometimes. Um, now I wanna get over a few things. Like I said before, Vietnam success and failure. You know, you had uh, analysts originally disputing the uh, Gulf of Tonkin resolution, uh, questioning the US abilities. Uh, and they say we did predict the Tet Offensive, but Johnson himself uh, ignored it. Uh, you know, Iraq, the national intelligence estimate, I think I mentioned before, uh, in 2002, it said Iraq was years away from WMDs, but the Bush administration took one sentence from uh, that national uh, intelligence estimate given to him that he used to read in 2002, and he basically took it. Now, remember the Gulf of Tonkin resolution? Uh, analysts did originally dispute that. So intelligence always isn't a failure, like we like to say, oh, intelligence failed in Iraq. Not necessarily it failed in Vietnam, not necessarily we politicized sized a lot of this data. Right. So even though analysts originally disputed the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, saying maybe it was due to weather, that is not attack from the Viet Cong that we attributed uh, the attack to to rationalize uh, and justify our attacks, you know, and it did say it, the, the intelligence did predict the Tet Offensive, uh, but, but Johnson did not want to study suggest uh, accept it because it would have been a failure. So he could have ignored it, which it seems like he did. And this is what happens. And remember the Cuban Missile Crisis? Uh, we did uh, find missiles in Cuba and a man named Oleg Podgolsky, uh, my Russian, isn't Privyet, Pajolsta, I forget some, I did take a few, five, helped with with uh, finding intelligence about the Cuban Missile Crisis. So, you know, intelligence does have, I think, some strengths, but we have the tendency to ignore it if we don't want it to be, um, we just don't want to accept it. And the same thing goes with Iran, 1953, uh, CIA overthrew the democratically elected government of Huckabo Arbenz. It was a disaster. This led to guerrilla warfare later that didn't end until like the late 1980s. Uh, same with Prime Minister uh, Mohammed Mossadegh. Uh, it might have been a quick success, but a long-term failure. Uh, and as you're going to see in the Edward Bernays video, it really shows how propaganda is used a lot in uh foreign policies, not just the United States, obviously, we were focusing right now, Lo and Thou is from the United States, so he's, he focuses on that, but we're going to see other uh, uh, views of the world, like the Myanmar video, where we're going to talk about, you know, what does Bangladesh have to do? You know, what about... Uh, um, and the Myanmar government, the refugees is non-state after the Rohingya uh, people. Yes, I do not know how to pronounce it, no matter how my students do correct me and they do a great job with it. But, uh, you know, they have their own, remember, non-state actors like the Kurds, they have their own national security concerns and intelligence. So this is going to be something uh, that is very, very important. Uh, and then, you know, a few things I wanted to talk about that I want you to think about is the whole collection swarm ball, uh, competing collection priorities, how they're dis discussed. You know, can we have competitive uh, analysis using not just different methods, uh, like, you know, now uh, geospatial methods are very important. They always have been, particularly in the Cuban Missile Crisis, but a lot of people don't know, like, they were using GIS uh, for uh, 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 two, that is, uh, combat the FARC. That's the FARC with an ex guerrilla group in Colombia, and they're using GIS because it's all jungle. So they were basically essentially using 
uh, very good by the United States of America, although I didn't support Plan Colombia, as you read my article. Uh, I think it was more about, you know, a big piñata, you hit the thing and it all comes out and, you know, you get these Beltway bandits, all these corporations getting more money, the CIA, all these, I mean, you know, these things, this is one of the, the points of, of all of the intelligence is that, you know, are we doing things in national security in general? Are we doing things for economic reasons? You know, Halle Burton didn't make a lot of money off that Iraq war, or are we doing it for strategic reasons? And this is something you people are going to have to come to a conclusion. But regardless, we used a wide range of information for uh, to root out the FARC and helping the Colombian military with GIS and other high tech things because in the jungle you can't see the guerrilla groups and it's not until you make these kind of maps to find these people and then use high tech um, bombings to, <laughs> to get it and, and I've been to Colombia quite a bit. Uh, I love Colombia, I've been all over uh, Colombia but a lot of area within Colombia is so jungle you know, if that's a adjective, jungle-esque, that you can't find people without this high-tech information, which is is good for competitive intelligence. So you have not only human intelligence, but you have high-tech intelligence and other types, and then you have different people's beliefs. So that's very, very important. And remember some things that the, the CIA, when I was particularly solicited to be a political analyst, don't forget, you know, they love language skills, people living there for a long time, you know, but if you live there too long, they start thinking you become a... <laughs> a, a, a more of uh, less of an asset because they think that you might become a turncoat for the lack of um, words. But we're going to get into this processing and exploitation imbalances. Is there too much? You know, I want you to really read the book, understand the book. The Pillar book is a very good book. I don't agree with it all. It's a very U.S. centric approach. Because remember, if the United States has these security concerns, so do other countries. So basically, when it goes over and says Iran, it was a success that we overthrew the prime minister Mossadegh in 1953, then Iran starts saying, wow, we have our own security concerns. The United States uh, invaded us, only wanted our oil, which is true. I mean, remember, the reason why we overthrew Mossadegh wasn't because of, he was a commie or anything like that. It's because he took over the oil fields. So we do not want people to do that. Same with our bands, with United Fruit, a uh, 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 company that lobbied uh, the um, Eisenhower administration to overthrow our bands because he started these progressive policies like land reform, which steps on the elite's interest. So United Fruit goes in and helps overthrow, but this is done with the CIA. So, you know, I, I, I think that we should be more critical because if we allowed our bands, like we did the exact opposite, Jose V. Figueres in Costa Rica, who had a lot of progressive policies like land reform, social security, etc., ended up being very popular in Costa Rica and was one of the main variables to help Costa Rica become more stable, which I think is very, very important. So, you know, you, 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 you see these, these things like, did we need to attack, say, Guatemala, Nicaragua during the 80s, even the, the brutal death squads in El Salvador, et cetera. Did we even need to overthrow Allende of Chile and install Pinochet for 30 some years that then ended up being corrupt, even though oh, he's not corrupt, and basically killing a massive amount of people and having a totalitarian state? What, are these things necessary? So this is something we have to think because intelligence plays a very big role in one of the uh, other lectures. We're going to talk about the family jewels, the church committee, and other things and political uh, analysts involved. And, and, you know, we spy a lot when we get into the spies, but don't, don't get fooled with Ann Chapman, you know, this conventionally speaking gorgeous Russian who is here spying for the Russians, etc. You know, spy, there's going to be a lot of spying out there. And I think one of the things is we get into more state actors like uh, Iran, Russia, China, etc. Uh, intelligence is going to be very, very important. Human intelligence to get into these states. These are sleeper cells, people who act like the people like, you know, we have people here spying on us, Cubans, say Miami, or we go there and spy. There's evidence of USAID and other organizations. But one thing that's interesting, and I want to end with here, you know, did the uh, Trump administration get warnings about the coronavirus prior 
uh, much sooner than he basically was able to approach this issue. And do you think Trump did a good job or is doing a good job in addressing this new national security uh, problem? And it's not really new, as we saw in influenza in 1918. That was a very important, I'm giving it to all my classes, a very important uh, um, problem is the spread of disease. Ebola, SARS, all these bird and pig flus going around. You know, but now the coronavirus, which basically shut the world down. When I left from Colombia, they were shutting it down. You know, no one could go out in Bogota. No one could go out in Medellin. They literally were multando, the multas. The, the, they were basically uh, fining people for going out. The world is shut down because of the coronavirus. What do you think about, did Trump downplay it? And did we have intelligence, good intelligence on this prior before, previously, beforehand, that we could have addressed this problem better. And, I, I, and I'm not going to give you what I think. I want you to think about this. We're going to see some stuff on this. We're going to read on this. This is very important and, and disease as national security problem. So thanks for coming out, everyone, and listening. You know, we have the community forum. Please stay in touch. You know, I miss everyone. You know, I like giving these classes in class. But now, under these conditions, at the time of this taping, we're basically under quarantine. Well, I am because, you know, I shouldn't have licked those doorknobs when I was going all over the airport. I'm just kidding. Okay, I'll see you soon. Please leave any questions uh, in um, the... Uh, Community forum. I got to remember what Canvas calls these things.